For a day and a half, the New York papers gave a good deal of space to the demonstration. One of the basier sort of Sunday papers devoted two pages to it with pictures and fantastic captions. An article was headed, The Great Harmonizer Tunes Up. Another, giving a supposed description of life at the Priory, told how the pupils would gather on the great lawn at midnight and begin a wild dance, and at its height, Gurdjieff himself would appear walking among them and calling out, Dance, dance, dance to freedom. There are always journalists who will drag the noblest ideas in the mire to provide a sensation for the Sunday reader. But the sensational articles did not prevent the succeeding demonstrations from being packed to capacity by really thoughtful people. Everywhere, among people who were doing things, as they say, or discussing anything, the subject of conversation became, have you seen the Gurdjieff dances? Some said the pupils were hypnotised, others that they were browbeaten because they never smiled. Others complained because they could not fit the dances into a category so that they could label them and write articles about them or about the system. No one was having the satisfaction of explaining to others what it was all about. This annoyed some of the intelligentsia who would have sneered had it not been for the high standing of Gurdjieff's older pupils. Araj had an international literary reputation of Mr. de Salzman, Gordon Craig had said that he understood more about stage lighting and stage sets than anyone in the Western world. De Hartman was a musician of the first rank, and Dr. Sturgeonoval had a high reputation in Russia as an alienist. All three of the young women pupils, English, Armenian, and Montenegrin, were numbered among the best dancers in Europe. As some said, there must be something in a system which constrains such fairy talents to follow Gurdjieff. On the other hand, a man from London, reader of the New Age, said to me, Isn't it a pity to see a man with Orage's reputation and gifts giving up his literary life in London to follow a charlatan? A lady, speaking to me about the demonstration, said, I understand that Mr. Gurdjieff lives in the forest of Pontonbleau with Catherine Mansfield and that they call themselves the Forest Lovers. My first personal contact with Gurdjieff took place a day or two after the demonstration. I had been talking to Jane Heap, who had come to the shop where I worked. She, with Margaret Anderson, was editing and publishing The Little Review which, if not the equivalent in America of the New Age in England, was similar in its aims. A few minutes after she had gone, Araj and Dr Sturgeonoval came in. At once I sensed that was, I was a mere youth in the presence of these adult men. Very soon I made another and more striking comparison. Gurdjieff arrived, very impressive, in a black coat with an astrakhan collar and wearing an astrakhan cap. With a twinkle in his eyes, he began to joke with the others. Then he walked round, and I found him standing beside me. I looked up and was struck by the expression of his eyes, with the depths of understanding and compassion in them. He radiated tremendous power and being, such as I had never in all my travels met in any man. And I sensed that, compared with him, both Dr Sturgeonoval and Naraj were as young men to an elder. I was a little uneasy and, as was my habit, tried to make conversation. Picking up a copy of Ospensky's Tertium Organum, which I had tried in vain to read, I said, Have you read this, Mr Gurdjieff? He made a gesture with his hand and said, Very difficult. I thought he meant it was difficult for him. I then said, Mr Gurdjieff, I should like, if you have room, to go and work at your institute. He replied, Room enough but also necessary to think about life. Many young men at institute study for life. One will be engineer, he studied to get paper. Very necessary in life had paper. He summed me up at a glance as a youth immersed in dreams. Thought dreams, feeling dreams, dreams of women. A youth to whom the idea of living in a community, 
relieved of responsibility, seemed very desirable to one part of me at any rate. This was the only occasion on which I tried to talk books with Gurdjieff. I was disappointed that only one of my friends, a man, the intellectuals from Croton, showed interest in the ideas of the Institute. The exception was Baldwin Robinson, the artist. The left was vaguely hostile, but the left is always opposed to ideas which have as their aim the changing of the inner state of man. They want to change outer conditions, results. Change the form of government and all will be well. The best is yet to be. Happiness for them is in the future. But as Pope says, Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. I speak of this because up to this time I had lived among the intelligentsia and believed as they did and was on the way to becoming a fossilised intellectual identified with outworn ideas. Almost every evening Gurdjieff met groups of people he did not give lectures in the ordinary way, but in formal talks consisting chiefly of questions and answers. Once at a meeting in Jane Heap's apartment, I was having difficulty in keeping my attention on the talk. It wandered continually to a good-looking young woman sitting not far from me, and I had a shock when, in answer to someone's question, Gurdjieff began to speak about sleep and attention. Indicating me, he said, this young man, for example, has no attention. He is more than three quarters asleep. I woke from my daydream and began to take notice. Someone asked him, how can we gain attention? He said, I shall not attempt, except on occasion, to re reproduce his broken English. In general, few people have attention. It is possible to divide one's attention into two or three parts. In this work, you must try to gain attention. Only when you have gained attention can you begin to observe yourself and know yourself. You must start on small things. What small things can we start on? Gurdjieff. You have nervous, restless movements which make people think you are a booby and have no authority over yourself. The first thing is to see these movements and stop them. If you work in a group, this may help. Even your family can help. Then you can stop these restless movements. Make this your aim. Then afterwards, perhaps you can gain attention. This is an example of doing. Everyone, when he begins in this work, wishes to do big things. If you start on big things, you will never do anything. Start on small things first. If you wish to play melodies and begin to play them without much practice, you will never be able to play real melodies. And those you play will make people suffer so that they will hate you. It is the same with psychological things. To gain anything real, long practice and much work is necessary. First, try to do small things. If you aim at big things, first you will never do anything or be anything and your actions will irritate people and cause them to hate you. About the middle of January 1924, at a meeting in the O'Neill studio, I arrived to find a number of people already sitting around. They were people who were comfortably off and interested in contemporary art, music and ideas. The meeting was time for nine, but it was almost ten before we saw Gurdjieff. He came in from another room, wearing a grey suit and an old pair of carpet slippers, and holding a large baked potato. Everyone became frigidly silent. He sat on the edge of the low platform facing us and began to eat. He seemed to be playing a part, that of a benevolent middle-aged gentleman at a party. He made a joke and the rather tense atmosphere disappeared in a peal of laughter. After a few remarks, his expression changed and he said, perhaps someone have question. The first question was, 
Would you explain about the law of three? Gurdjieff said, Take a simple thing, bread. You have flour, you have water, you mix. A third thing is necessary, heat. Then have bread. So in everything, three forces, three principles are necessary. Then you have result. Another said, It seems rather a silly question to ask. But what would you say is the difference between men and women? Gurdjieff. In general, men have minds more developed, women feelings more developed. Men are logical, women are not logical. Men should learn to feel more, women to think more. You must think, feel and sense the thing before it can become real to you. About sensing, you do not know what sensing is. You often mistake sensing for feeling and feeling for sensing. You must learn to know when you are thinking, when you are feeling and when you are sensing. Three processes necessary and much work is necessary for understanding. Question. What is suffering? I don't mean physical pain, but suffering that weighs on the feelings and on the mind. Perhaps I mean emotional and mental suffering when often there is no apparent reason for it. Gurdjieff. There are different kinds of suffering. In general, everyone suffers, but most of your suffering is mechanical. There are two rivers of life. In the first river, suffering is passive and unconscious. In the second river, suffering is voluntary, which is very different and of great value. All suffering has cause and consequence. Most of your suffering now is because of your corns or because someone treads on them. To get to the second river, you must leave everything behind. Can you tell us what place love has in your system? Gurdjieff. With ordinary love goes hate. I love this. I hate that. Today I love you. Next week or next hour or next minute I hate you. He who can really love can be. He who can be can do. He who can do is. To know about real love, one must forget all about love and must look for direction. As we are, we cannot love. We love because something in ourselves combines with another's emanations. This starts pleasant associations, perhaps because of chemico-physical emanations from instinctive centre emotional centre or intellectual centre or it may be from influences of external form or from feelings. I love you because you love me or because you don't love me. Suggestions of others, sense of superiority, from pity and for many other reasons, subjective and egoistic. We allow ourselves to be influenced. We project our feelings on others. Anger begets anger. We receive what we give. Everything attracts or repels. There is the love of sex, which, ordinarily known as love between men and women, when this disappears, a man and a woman no longer love each other. There is love of feeling, which evokes the opposite and makes people suffer. Later, we will talk about conscious love. In answer to another question, he said, All life needs love. Cows give more milk and hens more eggs when their keepers love them. Different people sowing seeds get different results. Strong men can wither plants through hate and even destroy other people. Begin by loving plants and animals, then perhaps you will learn to love people. Yes, said the questioner, but what is love? We talk about it all the time, but when I ask myself, I know that I don't know. Perhaps wishing a person well, wishing their good is loving them. But do I know what is good for people? Even for my own children, sometimes when I have struggled for something for their good, as I thought, it has turned out not to be good. Gurdjieff When you know that you don't know, it is already a great deal. You come to groups and we will later on speak about this. Question Why is it that men are so often attracted to women who make them suffer? And women, of course, by men in the same way. Gurdjieff Think over what I said 
about love of feeling. At the meetings, I always had a feeling of pleasure while listening to Gurdjieff. And I felt as if already I was on the way and able to do, and that henceforth I would be quite different. But by the next day, I'd slip back into the old ways. I knew in my essence that what he was saying was the truth I had so long been waiting to hear. But by myself, in life, I began to have some idea of the difficulty of doing anything. Though I felt it was the truth, I did not understand. I spoke to Araj about the difficulty I had in remembering what was said at the meetings and the difficulty of doing anything. He said, The time has not come yet for you to do. It is necessary to ponder everything that Gurdjieff says, to learn and prepare yourself. I asked, what is pondering? He replied, from one aspect it is thinking with the thinking part of each centre, mental, emotional and moving. In the New Testament it says, Mary pondered all these things in her heart. It means to go over them, weigh them. When I began to try to ponder, I realised that I had never pondered I had only milled over something with part of my emotions. So, remembering what Gurdjieff had said about me, I began to recall what I'd heard about sleep. Awake thou that sleepest, says the prophet. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, says Paul. According to the Sufis, the Christ that rose in the body of Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the ass of desire. In the Mahabharata, one of the great heroes is called Conqueror of Sleep. The Greeks spoke of the body as the tomb of the soul. And in the Orthodox Church, they sing at Easter, Christ is risen from the dead. He has conquered death by death and given life to those that were in the tomb. The idea is echoed in poetry. The Tudor poet wrote, All this night shrilled Chantilier. Days proclaiming, trumpeteer, claps his wings and loudly cries, Mortals, mortals, wake, arise. The crowing of the cock, to me, one of the sweetest sounds in nature, is often associated with waking. Prudentius said, At the crowing of the cock, Christ arose from the underworld, and Peter, when the cock crew, remembered himself. The idea is found in fairy tales. There is the sleeping beauty. In each one of us is a sleeping something, waiting to be awakened by the kiss of real teaching. Some nursery rhymes also convey the idea. Little boy blue, who is under a haystack fast asleep. The Sufi poet Attar, in the Conference of the Birds, speaks of the sleep that fills your life. The talks and demonstrations began to give me a taste of how deep in sleep I was. The first intimation that something was indeed beginning to make an impression on my subconscious, beginning to change in me, came in a dream. Ever since November 1917, when I was invalided out of the front line trenches on the Somme, I had been troubled by a dream which recurred every few nights. In the dream, I was again in the army, going into action, to what seemed certain death. Often I was shot and woke as I fell. Always the events were accompanied by a feeling of astonishment, mixed with dejection, despair and regret that I should have allowed myself once more to get into that terrible situation from which there was no escape. All the feelings of fear, hopelessness and despair were compressed into the few seconds before I woke. The dream was so much more real than reality that two or three minutes passed before I came to with an enormous sense of relief. A long and expensive course of psychoanalyst had produced no lasting effect. So long as I was with the analyst, I was free, for I transferred my suffering to him. When I left him, the fear returned. One result of the analysis was that I discovered that dreams are caused as often by fear and apprehension 
money and stomach as by sex. Ordinary psychoanalysts is like taking a piece of bent steel and twisting it straight. When it is released, it usually twists back again. A process of re-tempering is necessary. The Gurdjieff system, it seemed, was a technique for re-tempering. After a few weeks of going to meetings and demonstrations, the dreams of which I speak recurred. I was in the army, filled with depression, despondency and self-reproach for having let myself be caught again in that intolerable situation from which there seemed no escape. We were marching into action to be slaughtered. In war, and in our waking state, nature generally provides buffers between the emotions of fear and the prospect of painful wounds, suffering and death. But in dreams the buffers are removed, and I, in my dreams, suffered a realisation of what war really is. Now in the dream, something began to change, and I found myself withdrawn from the army. I was on a high place, it was dark, but in the gloom I could discern the army below, marching away without me, and the feeling of enormous relief possessed me. Behind me was a glow of light in which I could dimly see the forms of two men. I looked round and saw Gurdjieff and Araj, and I heard one say, A way of escape? Then I woke. The recurring dream never quite left me, but little by little it became less troublesome, and there was always a way out, and in time it was accompanied by only a feeling of vague unrest. Perhaps I did not want to forget it entirely. Perhaps I wanted to remember the state of sleep I was in when I offered myself as a sacrifice to Moloch, Kali, Shiva the Destroyer, Mars, or whatever name men gave to the force of destruction. There were further demonstrations of the movements and dances at the neighbourhood playhouse, the Church of St Mark's in the Bowery, and Carnegie Hall. At the neighbourhood playhouse was read what became From the Author in Beelzebub's Towers, in which he speaks about the river of life. And it was here, at the end of one of the demonstrations, as the pupils was leaving the platform, that Gurdjieff called one of the young women, a beautiful and accomplished dancer, and in a voice that most could hear, rebuked her. He said, You spoil my work. You dance for yourself, not for me. And she began to defend herself. He made a gesture with his hand and walked away. I was rather shocked, but it brought home to me the connection between the Gurdjieff system and the Christian idea of doing all for the glory of God, the idea of working for one's own inner being and for the glory of God. In February, I accompanied Oraj to Boston, where he was to make arrangements for a demonstration and the possible formation of a group. I hoped that I should be of use, for I knew important people in Boston and Cambridge. When I found myself in Cambridge in 1919, I had the idea of taking a degree in English literature and psychology, but suffering as I was from the disillusionment and restlessness caused by the war, I found it difficult to study. Sitting one day in the Widener Library, the idea came to me concerning psychology, that it would take three years to master one school, and that there were several schools, each specialising in only one aspect of man's psyche. To study all the well-known schools and so get a complete view of man would take years. Would I then know very much more about myself and other men? Something seemed to tell me that I would not, and so with the academic study of literature, culture as an end in itself no longer interested me. I gave up the idea of studying at Harvard and continued my pilgrimage around the world. But I'd formed a friendship with Charles Townsend Copeland, which was renewed at this, my second visit to America. He was a professor and a public figure, but also a warm human being. I told Oraj that I thought he might be very useful. I doubt it, he said. I've met only one professor interested in real ideas the Frenchman, Professor Denis Surat. Even businessmen are more likely to be interested than professors, scholars or writers. 
None of the important people I talked to showed the least interest in Gurdjieff, who was regarded as just another eccentric philosopher from a Europe. My stay in Boston with Viraj gave me opportunities of talking to him and getting to know him. In answer to a question I asked about the purpose of Gurdjieff's visit to America, he said, The demonstrations, the meetings and talks, are a kind of net thrown out. Of the hundreds of people who see and hear, only a few, in a state of dissatisfaction with themselves and with life, will feel that we have something they are looking for. It does not necessarily mean that these few will be unhappy people. They may be leading an active life, be well off and comfortably situated. But they will feel that there is something else besides the round of ordinary existence. In other words, there are certain people who possess a magnetic centre, or the beginnings of one. These are the people who have the possibility of working on themselves. The rest of humanity, not feeling the need, will do nothing. We are, in fact, offering people an opportunity of having a purpose in life, of using their suffering, the dissatisfactions they feel for their own good. How many will take it? We shall see. Were you in a state of dissatisfaction with yourself and life when you met Gurdjieff? I asked. Indeed I was. I was already beginning to be disillusioned with the purely literary and cultural life when I met Ospensky, who came to see me before 1914. It was becoming more and more difficult for me to force myself to write the notes of the week in the new age. It had been a profound disappointment to me to realise that my intellectual life, with which was associated all that was highest and best in Western culture, was leading me nowhere. And as they used to say, I had not found God. Then you knew Ospensky before he met Gurdjieff? Yes, I corresponded with Ospensky when he was a journalist in Russia, and he came to see me when he was on his way to Russia from the East in 1914. When the revolution broke out there, I put him in touch with Mr F. S. Pinder, who was the British government representative in Ekaterinburg. Ospensky was stranded and Pindar gave him a job on his staff. The government wouldn't pay his salary, and I believe Pindar said paid that out of his pocket. When Ospensky arrived in England for the second time, he came to see me. I got in touch with some writers, doctors, psychologists and others, and meetings were held in Lady Rothermere's studio in St John's Wood. Ospensky had found what I was looking for, but after Gurdjieff's first visit to Ospensky's group, I knew that Gurdjieff was the teacher. Eventually, I sold the New Age, gave up my literary life in Ospensky's groups, and went to Fontainebleau. My first weeks at the Priory were weeks of real suffering. I was told to dig, and as I had had no real exercise for years, I suffered so much physically that I would go back to my room, a sort of cell, and literally cry with fatigue. No one, not even Gurdjieff, came near me. I asked myself, is this what I had given up my whole life for? At least I had something then. Now what have I? When I was in the very depths of despair, feeling that I could, could, could go on no longer, I vowed to make extra effort, and just then something changed in me. Soon I began to enjoy the hard labour, and a week later Gurdjieff came to me and said, Now, Araj, I think you dig enough. Let us go to cafe and drink coffee. From that moment things began to change. This was my first initiation. The former things had passed away. Thus, Uraj, who, through his paper, The New Age, had been the focal point of all that was best in all branches of contemporary thought of that period, but whose paper men like Chesterton, Belloc, Shaw, Wells and Arnold Bennett were glad to write for nothing, of whom T.S. Eliot said that he was the best literary critic of his time. I learnt from Uraj that Gurdjieff, on his last visit to Ospensky in London, had taken F.S. Pinder with him to interpret... Ospensky had disagreed with some of Pinder's interpretations, but Gurdjieff insisted. He thought Ospensky was too intellectual, with too much theory, and too little practical work. Eventually, only Oraj and Pinder and a few others were left of the English pupils at the Priory. 
The rest returned to London. Among the Espensky pupils was a Mr J. G. Bennett, who was there for a few odd days. He did not meet Gurdjieff again until shortly before his death in 1949. Mr Roland Kenny, who had been editor of the Daily Herald during its first year in 1912, and his wife were also at the Priory for a time. Arage said that he was grateful to Espensky for being the means of his meeting Gurdjieff, as it was only then that I began to distinguish between knowledge and understanding. Arage added, Espensky for me represented knowledge, great knowledge, Gurdjieff understanding, though of course Gurdjieff had all the knowledge too. F.S. Pinder, who also had no doubt of Gurdjieff as the teacher, was a civil engineer. After he met Ospensky at Ekaterindor, he was imprisoned by the Bolsheviks and sentenced to death. During his imprisonment, he perfected his Russian. Ultimately, he was released and after the war was awarded the OBE. It is interesting to me, by the way, that these three, Araj, Pindar and Kenny, remarkable men in the real meaning of the word, Men of understanding had received, like myself, their lack of education, as they expressed it, in elementary or board schools, now council schools. It is a great blessing when a man can have the friendship of men older and in some respects wiser than himself, a friendship based on something essential and on a common and fundamental aim. Friendship with women and love of them can go on at the same time, but can never be a substitute. I count myself fortunate to have had these three as friends, as iron sharpeneth iron. Another conversation with Raj in Boston began with my saying, Are you going to start esoteric groups in New York? If so, I should like to become a pupil. No, he replied, not esoteric, nor even mesoteric. These are very far from us. If we can start an outer exoteric group, we shall do well. But isn't the Priory an esoteric school? It is, probably the only one in the Western world today. But a man may live at the Priory and be quite unaware of it. You get from the Priory just as much as you give him work on yourself. That is, according to real effort. There are people living there now to whom the place is no more than a maison de santé. It seems, I said, that you and I have started at opposite ends. I have done almost every kind of physical work and earned my living at many kinds of jobs. I have travelled or lived in 20 different countries, but I have never used my mind. As a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so am I before intellectuals, inarticulate. Physical work or business for me is easy, but to use my mind, difficult. I cannot think things out. I only feel. Well, he replied, I think I can say that I know more about current intellectual ideas than most men. But when I began to work with Gurdjieff, I soon realised that I understood almost nothing. I had to begin all over again. In this system, we all, as it were, start from scratch. At the same time, my background as an editor can be very useful in this work. He added, you, you know, think with your feelings. You must learn to think with your mind. One of the aims of this work is to enable a man to sense, feel and think simultaneously. We are all abnormal in that we are undeveloped in one or more of our centres. That is why Gurdjieff calls his school the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. Is it true that we are all abnormal? I asked. Take Bernard Shaw, for example. I've met him several times. I should have thought that he was normal. I have known the Shaws well for many years, said Diraj. I was with them the day before they were married. Shaw fills with his mind and he lacks what is called emotional understanding. On one occasion, Shaw and I were dining together with a woman friend and the talk turned on emotion and intellect. The woman said to him, But you know, Shaw, you lack emotional understanding. What do you mean, he said. Of course I have emotional understanding. Oh no, she said. Araj has it, but you haven't. Shaw was annoyed, for he could not see 
that this was true. Later, when he left, she said, Poor old Shaw, he was a bit hurt. His trouble is that his brains had gone to his head. I'm disappointed, I said, that none of my friends in Cambridge or Boston are interested either in the Gurdjieff ideas or in seeing a demonstration of the dances. When I was at Harvard in 1919, it seemed to me that the life of the cultured people in Cambridge was perhaps the best that could be found, comparable to the cultured life of 18th century England before the dark ages of the 19th and 20th centuries. I agree, said Raj, but according to Gurdjieff, the inner development of individual man does not depend on culture. The culture may provide a background. On the contrary, culture depends on developed individual man, or rather a group of men working together. The flowerings and blossomings of culture which occur from time to time in history, apparently for no reason, the building of the Gothic cathedrals, the Renaissance, Shakespeare's plays, are examples of the results of a group of men working consciously. Another thing, you cannot convince anyone of the soundness of Gurdjieff's system by intellectual argument, and we do not wish to convince people or make converts. We offer a means of help to those who feel the need of it. Those that are whole, you know, have no need of a physician. Gurdjieff says that the Priory is a repair shop for broken down motor cars. I returned to New York in the state of wanting to take an active part in the dances and groups, but something held me back. There was, as they say, a struggle between two parts of me. One part said, make an effort, do it. The other part said, wait, you don't know what you may be letting yourself in for. Really, it was a mixture of fear, timidity and inertia that held me back. Fear that I might have to give up something I cherished. Certain vague things I clung to. So instead of taking an active part in the classes of movements, I merely watched. Being what I was, I could do no other. A machine can only behave as a machine. I was chiefly afraid that I might be prevented from gratifying my precious whim, that of starting a bookshop in New York. Whims, desires arise usually from causes unknown to us, some legitimate, some not. The non-legitimate, those which are harmful, have to be repressed. The harmless ought to be satisfied or they may give us no peace. Satisfy your harmless whims, but don't cultivate them, Raj said. In this work, you are not required to give up anything. Things and associations will drop away of themselves when you are no longer identified with them. After all, you have to do something for a living. Why not a bookshop? I want to go to the Priory too, I said. Well, why not do both? Spend the summer at the Institute and then come back and start your business. But tell me, why do you want to be a bookseller? Because I'm fond of books. To become a bookseller because you are fond of books is, to my mind rather like becoming a butcher because you are fond of animals. There was another problem. In Russia, I had met a young American woman. We had parted, gone our respective ways and met again in New York. We had had a great deal in common and we had become engaged. But already our common interest seemed weakening. She was becoming resentful of my interest in the Gurdjieff system and after the first demonstration refused to go to the meetings any more. She complained that Gurdjieff was against the Russian Revolution and that already I was losing my interest in the things we had both worked for, social reform and the good of others. When I told her I was planning to go to the Priory and asked her to come, she said, no, you have to choose between Gurdjieff and me. I told Raj, who said, a man I knew in London was in a similar situation. He was in love with a woman. In time, something cropped up which he very much wished to do. It meant a great deal to him. When he told the woman, she began to raise objections. The more they discussed it, the harder she pleaded with him not to do it, at last with tears in her eyes. Now he no longer resisted, and no sooner did he tell her that he had given up his plans than she despised him for his weakness. Their relationship eventually came to an end. He never forgave himself, 
and he had to make great efforts to carry out his original, though now modified, plans. This made a deep impression on me, for although Orage did not know, he could have been relating an event in my own life of a few years before. I too had never forgiven myself, and, but for the intervention of Araj, I might have repeated my mistake. You must remember, Araj continued, that American women, more than any others, are spoilt. Of course, all women want their own way, but one of the tragedies of American life is that women have succeeded in getting it to the extent of dominating the men. The passive force has become the active. One of the consequences is the enormous number of divorces here compared with Europe. Gurdjieff blames men for the deterioration in the status of women in America. The strange thing is that America regard it as a sign of progress. Even the peasant women of Central Europe instinctively understand the art of love better than a great many sophisticated American women, or English women for that matter. Women fail to grow up inwardly because their men remain children. Women wish to be dominated in the right way, but it takes a man to dominate a woman. European men have had thousands of years in which to become relatively adult. Americans, instead of going on where a European's left off, have returned to childhood, or at least adolescence. But while it is one of their great drawbacks, it is also one of their possibilities. It is possible to do something with children. Gurdjieff says that Americans have more possibilities for good than any other nation, but that they are so at the mercy of wrong ideals brought from a Europe and eventually distorted, they have come to power and money so easily that their civilization may decay and rot long before it is ripe. In a real civilization, woman understands her function and has no wish to be other than a woman. I told my young mistress that I'd chosen to go to Fontainebleau. During this winter, when every few days I encountered a new experience, there occurred the meeting with a wise woman. I heard about her through a friend, on whose suggestion I sent to her my full name and date of birth and a fee. In a few days there came back four closely written sheets of paper about my essential characteristics and possibilities, good and bad, and even an outline of the types of circumstances I should be likely to meet. Some of the things she told me about myself were extraordinary, possibilities of good and evil that I never even suspected. She also outlined the characteristics of people I had not yet met, but who later became part of my life. She lived in a small town in northern New York State, and I went to see her, a quiet, sympathetic little woman, She was of the type of wise woman that I'd met in villages in Russia, for in old Russia every village had its wise woman, or one who was endowed to an unusual extent with the subconscious wisdom of the race, to whom the peasants would go for advice and to talk over their problems. She was not a medium in the usual spiritualist sense. I asked her how she knew so much about me, whom she had neither either seen or heard of. She said... I don't know. I take your paper in my hands, I do some calculations, then I sit at the typewriter and put myself in a certain state, and it just comes to me. At first I used to tell people what I thought was going to happen to them, but this depends on many things and I was often wrong, so I stopped it. Now I just do character, and I feel that I can help people by telling them of their possibilities, both good and bad. She could tell things about a person by writing, only when she was alone, not by talking, but by using the gift called, or rather miscalled, by spiritualists, psychometry. It almost seems as if the film of our life was made at our birth and presented to us, and that certain people in certain states can see bits of it ahead. If we are told about our future, we put our subjective interpretation on it, and waste energy hoping for the expected good and fearing the expected bad. We became friends and I took her to one of the demonstrations. This, she said, is the real thing. Mr Gurdjieff is a man who understands the meaning of true religion. He is a man who has seen God. It is not enough to say, know thyself. 
and it is always a shock to be told about one's dark side, for we do not wish to see it. Gurdjieff's system provides a technique, said Raj. You can be told of your faults for years, but unless you make the right kind of effort yourself, you will remain the same. His system has a method not taught in books, by which you can learn little by little how to make this effort to know yourself. But you must be prepared to work for a long time, for years perhaps, and there will be long periods when nothing seems to happen and nothing in oneself seems to change. Gurdjieff took his pupils first to Boston and then to Chicago, where demonstrations and talks were given. From all this effort, the subsequent results were small. The seeds fell on stony ground. On the return to New York, a final demonstration was given in Carnegie Hall. There had been trouble with the musicians' union over the orchestra, the union insisting on extra players being employed, including a pianist. So Gurdjieff dispensed with the lot, and Mr. de Hartman alone played the music on a concert grand piano. This last demonstration was the only one in New York at which sheets were sold. Since a number of the audience were sitting in far away cheaper seats and some of the expensive ones were empty, Gurdjieff invited the people in the cheaper seats to come nearer and fill the dearer ones, which they did. The programme was very long, lasting nearly four hours, yet few people left before the end. Needless to say, they did not stay out of politeness. All the dances and movements were performed and also the tricks and the half tricks. Except for the lecture talk which was read at the neighbourhood playhouse and which was eventually added to Beelzebub's towels, all the explanations were read. I remember this particular evening because of something which later astonished me. With me was a rich young woman who had come more in the hope of seeing Raj than the demonstration. After the performance, she suggested asking Gurdjieff to take coffee with us. Surprisingly, he agreed. Leaving all the important people in Carnegie Hall, he led us to Childs in Columbus Circle across the way. I was struck by the way he crossed the road through the traffic, not in the nervous, tense way most people do, but as if he was sensing with the whole of his presence, completely aware of what he was doing, like a wise elephant, I had seen making his way in a difficult part of a forest in Burma. While we drank coffee, Gurdjieff spoke of the difficulties he encountered in getting money for his work. People will pay anything for trivial things, he said, but for something they really need, even in ordinary life, they will not pay. I asked him some questions, only because I thought I ought to say something, and he answered so that, Seeing, I should not see, and hearing, I should not understand. Also, conditioned as I was by a religious upbringing to believe that salvation was free for all, a feeling arose in me that Gurdjieff's teaching ought to be imparted for nothing, and that such a man should have no difficulty in getting all the money he needed. So although I could have given him a few hundred dollars, which would have been useful to him then, I refrained, and this was for me one of the many things which later became a reminding factor, as he called it, for remorse of conscience. Gurdjieff had set Raj a big task, that of raising enough money for his stay in America. Raj did not mind being poor, but his family had suffered much from poverty when he was a boy, and he hated it. Equally, he hated having to slave for money, and almost as much as he disliked asking for money for any purposes, even one not his own. Gurdjieff had arrived in New York with 40 people and with no money. At the same time, he insisted that the first demonstration should be free. So Raj had to use his assets to the limit, his charm, his persuasiveness, his fame as an editor. Americans are open-handed people, and really love to give to something that touches them, and that with no expectation of material reward, or even the publicity usually so dear to them. Money flowed in. Raj said, We are naive about money, according to Gurdjieff. 
Both as individuals and nations, we are hypnotised by ideas of money, ideas that have existed for ages. Thousands of people are being made bankrupt and hundreds of thousands are being thrown out of work in England now, 1924, because the financial director, Montague Norman, says that the monetary system must not be changed. Each age has its superstitions. In each age, men and women are sacrificed to false gods, false ideals. Gurdjieff says that the attitude to finance is all part of the dream state that we live in. If men could wake up, it would very soon be changed. Gurdjieff's attitude to money is different from that of anyone I have met. He needs money for his aim. Nothing important can be done without money. At least one of Jesus' preaching trips was financed by rich women. Gurdjieff may appear to be throwing money about, but he calculates and uses it for certain non-personal ends. A few days ago, a man gave him a cheque for $100 for his great work, implying by his money that he was conferring a favour. Gurdjieff thanked him profusely and invited him to dinner the next day at a restaurant. There were ten of us at the mill. When the waiter brought the bill, Gurdjieff disputed it, saying that he'd forgotten to charge for something or other, and the waiter took the bill away. When he returned, Gurdjieff looked at it, paid it, gave the waiter a good tip, and placed the bill on the table so that the donor could see it. I was sitting next to him. It came to just one hundred dollars. Someone asked, what place has free will in your system? Ordinary man, Gurdjieff replied, has no will. He does nothing of himself. What is regarded as will is merely a strong desire. A strong man has strong desires. A weak man, weak desires. Man is pulled this way and that way by his desires, his wants. He has no real wish but many wants. A man may have many desires, but one may predominate, and he devotes his life to accomplishing this desire. He sacrifices everything, and people say he has a strong will. Only a man who has an I can have will. When man has an I, he can be master of himself. Then he has will that is free. Not a want or a desire, subject to everything around him, which can change with food, people, climate, sex. Real will comes with conscious wish, by doing things voluntarily. But you must work for years, for centuries perhaps. We have a master in us, but this master is asleep. He must wake up and control all these little masters in us. Very often what is called will is an adjustment between willingness and unwillingness. For example, the mind wants something, the feelings do not want it. If the mind in this case is stronger than the feelings, man obeys his mind. If the two are more or less equal, the result is conflict, hesitation, dilly-dallying. This is what is called free will in ordinary man. He is ruled now by the mind, now by the feelings, now by the body, still more often by the sex centre. After the meeting, someone asked Raj, does the system provide a technique for obtaining free will and is there a clear statement or description of the system in print? Raj replied, there are two parts to this question. First, there is a definite technique or method for practical work on oneself. There is also a theoretical side as taught by Ospensky in London. At the Priory, both are taught, but for new people the work is mostly practical. Gurdjieff says that both the practical method and the theory are taught little by little. They are given out in bits and pieces which have to be fitted in and stuck together. But you must make paste, he says. Without paste, nothing will stick. Will and the acquiring of will is a great mystery. No one has ever seen will, but we can see its manifestations in those who have it. 
Gurdjieff, for example, has tremendous will. It is the power to do. Well, asked another, how would you put into words the technique by which will may be acquired? First of all, said Raj, you must know that wrong will can be acquired. For example, a man wishes to have power over people for his own material ends. After a time, something crystallises in him, but wrong crystallisation. The method can be summed up in the following phrase. Voluntary suffering and conscious labour. Voluntary suffering is compelling oneself to bear the unpleasing manifestations of others. Conscious labour is the effort to sense, remember and observe oneself. It is the doing of small things consciously. The effort made against the inertia and mechanism of the organism. Not for personal gain or profit, not for exercise, health, sport, pleasure or science and not out of pique or like and dislike. Self-remembering never becomes a habit. It is always the result of a conscious effort. Very small to begin with, but it increases with doing. A moment of self-remembering is a moment of consciousness, that is, of self-consciousness. Not in the ordinary sense, but a consciousness of the real self, which is I, together with an awareness of the organism, the body, the feelings and thoughts. A woman novelist said to Gurdjieff at one meeting, I sometimes feel that I am more conscious when I am writing. Is this so or do I imagine it? He replied, You live in dreams and you write about your dreams. Much better for you if you were to scrub one floor consciously than to write a hundred books as you do now. About self-remembering, he said, a man cannot remember himself because he tries to do so with his mind, at least in the beginning. Self-remembering begins with self-sensing. It must be done through the instinctive moving centre and the emotional centre. Mind alone does not constitute a human being any more than the driver is the whole equipage. The centre of gravity of change is in the moving and emotional centres. But these are concerned only with the present. The mind looks ahead. The wish to change, to be what one ought to be, must be in our emotional centre and the ability to do in our body. The feelings may be strong, but the body is lazy, sunk in inertia. Mind must learn the language of the body and feelings. And this is done by correct observation of self. One of the benefits of self-remembering is that one has the possibility of making fewer mistakes in life. But for complete self-remembering, all the centres must work simultaneously and they must be artificially stimulated. The mental centre from the outside, the other two from inside. You must distinguish between sensation, emotions and thoughts and say to each sensation, emotion and thought, Remind me to remember you. And for this you must have an I. And you must begin by separating inner things from outer. To separate I from it. It is similar to what I said about internal and external considering. Someone said, I'm not very clear about what you mean by considering. Gurdjieff replied, I will give you a simple example. Although I am accustomed to sitting with my legs crossed under me, I consider the opinion of the people here and sit as they do, with my legs down. This is external considering. As regards inner considering, someone looks at me, as I think disapprovingly. This starts corresponding associations in my feelings. If I am too weak to refrain from reacting, I am annoyed with him. I consider internally and show that I am annoyed. This is how we usually live. We manifest outside what we feel inside. We should try to draw a line between the inner and the outer impacts. Externally, we should sometimes consider even more than we do now. Be more polite to people than we usually are, for example. It can be said that what until now has been outside should be inside 
and what was inside should be outside. Unfortunately, we always react, but why should I be annoyed or hurt if someone looks at me disapprovingly, or if he doesn't look at me, doesn't notice me? It may be that he himself is the slave of someone else's opinion. Perhaps he is an automaton, a parrot repeating another's words. Perhaps someone has trod on his corns. And tomorrow he may change. If he is weak and I am annoyed with him, I am even weaker. And by considering making a mountain out of a molehill and getting into a state of resentment, I may spoil my relations with other people. It must be understood very clearly and established as a principle that you must not let yourselves become slaves to other people's opinions. You must be free from those around you. And when you become free inside, you will be free of them. At times it may be necessary for you to pretend to be annoyed. And it does not follow that if someone slaps you on one cheek, you should always offer the other. It is necessary sometimes to answer back in such a way that the others will forget his grandmother. But you must not consider internally. On the other hand, if you are free inside, it may happen that if someone slaps you on one cheek, it is better to offer the other cheek. It depends on the other person's type. And sometimes a man will not forget such a lesson in a hundred years. Sometimes one should retaliate, other times not. A man can choose only when he is free inside. An ordinary man cannot choose, cannot sum up the situation quickly and impartially. For with him his external is his internal. It is necessary to work on oneself, to learn to be unbiased, to sort out and analyse each situation as if one were another person. Only then can one be just. To be just at the moment of action is a hundred times more valuable than to be just afterwards. And only when you can be really impartial as regards yourself will you be able to be impartial towards others. A very great deal is necessary for this. Free will is not to be had for the asking, nor can it be bought in a shop. Impartial action is the basis of inner freedom, the first step towards free will. At another meeting, the question was asked, is it necessary to suffer all the time to keep conscience open? As I've already told you, said Gurdjieff, there are very many kinds of suffering. This also is a stick with two ends. One kind of suffering leads to the angel, the other to the devil. Man is a very complicated machine. By the side of every good road there runs a corresponding bad one. One thing is always side by side with another. Where there is little good there is little bad. Where there is much good there is also much bad. Where there is a strong positive, there will be a strong negative. But where there is much bad, it does not mean that there will be also much good. With suffering, it is easy to find oneself on the wrong road. Suffering easily becomes transformed into pleasure. Many people love their suffering. You are hit once, you are hurt. The second time you are hit, you feel it less. The fifth, you already wish to be hit. One must not fall asleep, but always be alert. One must know what is necessary at each moment, or one may stumble off the path into the ditch. Another question. What part does conscious play in the acquiring of an eye? In the beginning, replied Gurdjieff, conscience helps in that it saves time. He who has conscience can be calm. He who has calm has time which he can use for work. Later, conscience serves another purpose. With an ordinary man, most of his time is occupied with considering. One association stops, another begins. He goes out in the morning glad. In a few minutes he becomes sad. Another few minutes and he is resentful or angry. He is at the mercy of hundreds of useless associations. The machine works all the time. The energy collected during sleep sets our daytime associations flowing. All day the expenditure goes on in us. Our state of energy is sufficient for our ordinary mechanical life, but not for work on ourselves. 
If, for example, we compare the energy that is expended by a 15 watt electric bulb, the energy expended by active work corresponds to a 100 watt bulb, which very quickly consumes the available current. If we use our store of energy in useless associations, anxiety, resentment, worry and so on, we shall have only enough energy, say, for the morning, and none for the rest of the day. And without energy, man is only a lump of flesh. What we have to do is to learn to spend our energy economically. Nature formed us so that we could have enough energy to do both kinds of work, ordinary life work and work on ourselves. But we have forgotten how to work normally, hence the waste of energy. The energy produced by our dynamo and stored in our battery is used up by our movements, emotions, sensations and manifestations. We spend it not only on what is necessary, but on what is unnecessary. For example, when you sit and talk, you need energy for this, but you gesticulate as well. This may be necessary for emphasis, but no energy is needed for the legs and other muscles. Yet all the time you sit tensed up. You cannot help this, even if you know it. Your mind has no power to give orders. A long period of exercises is needed to free oneself from unnecessary tensions. However, the body does not use as much energy as associations do. All the time we have thousands of useless thoughts, feelings and experiences, pleasant and unpleasant, and they all take place without I. The energy used in conscious work is converted for future use. That used unconsciously is lost forever. Question. How can we economise energy? To learn this, a long time is needed. You cannot begin by trying to economise energy of the emotions. Begin by what is easier. Energy is the body. When you have learnt this, you will have acquired a taste which will serve as a key. Question. Do we use less energy when we are lying down? When you are lying down, you have fewer external impacts, but you may spend much more energy in mental associations. You may spend less energy in walking than in sitting, because the legs move by momentum and need to be pushed only from time to time. When a car is running in low gear, it uses more energy than when in top gear. When a great part of the motion is by momentum. When you are lying down, a prey to associations, you are in low gear, so to speak. In the same way, the expenditure of energy of a given muscle may be different. At another meeting, he was asked, What is the attitude of your system to morality? Morality, he replied, can be subjective or objective. Objective morality is the same for all men everywhere. Subjective morality is different in different countries and at different periods. Everyone defines subjective morality differently. What one person calls good is called by another bad and vice versa. Subjective morality is also a stick with two ends. It can be turned this way and that. From the time when a men appeared on the earth, from the time of Adam, they began to be formed in us with the help of God, of nature and our surroundings, and organs whose function is conscience. Every man has this organ, and whoever is guided by his conscience lives according to the precepts of the inner voice. But man lives according to the whim of subjective conscience, which, like subjective morality, is different everywhere. Objective conscience is not a stick with two ends. It is a realisation of what is good and bad formed in us through the ages. But it happens that this organ, for many reasons, is covered by a kind of crust, which can only be broken by intense suffering. Then conscience speaks. But after a time man calms down, and again the organ is covered up. In ordinary circumstances, a strong shock is needed for the organ to be uncovered. For example, 
A man's mother dies and he begins to hear the voice of conscience. To love, honour and cherish one's mother is the duty of every man. But man is seldom a good son. When his mother dies, he remembers how he behaved towards her and he begins to suffer from remorse. Man is also a great swine, and like a swine he soon forgets. Conscience sinks down again and he begins to live in his usual automatic way. He who has no conscience cannot be truly moral. Another example, I may know what I ought not to do, but from weakness I cannot refrain. For instance, the doctor tells me that coffee is bad for me. I think about it, but only when I do not feel a craving for coffee do I agree with him and refrain from drinking it. It is the same with everything. Only when a man is full can he be moral. You should forget about morality. Present talk about morality is empty, pouring from the empty into the void. Your aim is to be Christians in the real sense. But to be able to be a Christian, you must be able to do, and at present you cannot. When you are able to do, you will be able to become Christians. External morality is different everywhere, and in this one should behave like others. As they say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. This is external morality. For inner morality, you must be able to do.